we are, we are in a short series that we are calling Cruciform. Um, cruciform means in the shape of the cross. And this whole series is about how the cross of Jesus Christ redefines us and reshapes us as Christians. In fact, to be a Christian means that the cross has redefined you and is reshaping your life. And only when we live in light of the cross do we really, actually, truly come alive. Now, last week, we started by laying down the foundation for this series. We're, we're looking at how the word of the cross, as Paul talks about, or, or how the gospel of Jesus Christ redefines us as Christians. One of the things that we have to realize, uh, just sort of like a, a, a foundational belief that Christians have, is that at one point we were dead in our sins and trespasses. At one point... We were defined by our sin, both the sin of commission, the things that we do wrongly, and the sins of omission, the good things that we're meant to do that we don't do. Those failures, those foibles defined us. They, they're a, a scarlet mark on us. But because God is gracious and Jesus is true, he came in this world to die for us, to pay the price for our sins. And by grace, through faith, we receive a brand new identity. We get redefined. So it's no longer a definition by my sins, the things that I do and don't do, but we are redefined by Christ's perfect obedience. We are credited with righteousness. Paul talks about this to the Corinthians, that he who knew no sin became sin. He, he took my sin, our sin, upon ourselves so that we might be the righteousness of Christ. So we start out by understanding this cruciform life begins with being redefined by the cross, that Jesus suffered and died in our place on the cross to justify us, to make us right, and to reconcile us, to bring us back into relationship with God. So therefore, by his death, we are given new life with a new identity. We are in Christ. But the cross of Christ not only redefines us, as we'll explore today, the cross of Christ totally reshapes us. The cross of Christ gives a template for our life. It reforms our life around the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, this is the big picture of 1 Corinthians. We, we spent time last week digging into 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where the, the whole thing opens up with Paul saying, hey, I came to you, and all I knew was Christ and him crucified. All I came to you knowing was the word of the cross. And as Paul's theological discourse to the Corinthians um, unfolds, he gets to chapter 11, and he sort of gets to the implication of, of what it means to reckon with the word of the cross. What it means to, uh, to know and understand and to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says that you are to imitate me as I imitate Christ. Once you understand the word of the cross, it, it calls you into a life that is formed by the cross, which means to be a Christian, it doesn't, simply mean that you're just a fan of Jesus, right? You hear the stuff that Jesus did. He died on the cross. He loved me. He laid his life down for me. It's like, oh yeah, that's great. I love that. That sounds like, sounds like Jesus is a nice guy. I'm a big fan of that. And we could give our applause and, and, and kind of prop him up and say, go Jesus. We, we, we're a big fan of you. That's not where it stops for the Christian. That, that we, you, our worship does say that. We, we praise Jesus for what he's done for us. But there is another sequence to this that we follow, that we imitate, that we emulate this Christ who laid down his life for us. See, what this means is the new life that Jesus gives you as a Christian is a cruciform life, a life shaped by the gospel, shaped by the cross. Now, this is what Jesus teaches in Matthew 16. It's sort of like this could very much be the anthem of this sermon series when in, in verse 24, Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, to follow Jesus, to be a follower of Jesus, to be a Christian, means to carry a cross, it means to have a life that is shaped by this cross. Now, we're going to spend the rest of our sermon series uh, of cruciform building out what this cruciform life looks like. We're asking, okay, if I'm redefined by the cross, if the cross shapes my life, what then does it look like? What are the real, tangible, practical things, the markers of the Christian life? And what I want to do today is start out with the two primary distinctives. 
The, the two things that basically everything else rides on, that if you, if you take these away, you no longer have a cruciform life. I'm going to show you these two things by looking uh, at Matthew 16, verses 13 through 48, which was just read a moment ago. Now, this is a big passage. There's a lot of ground to cover. I was telling the people back in pre-service prayer, if we were preaching through the gospel of Matthew, it's very likely that I would break each of these passages up. Uh, you, you can see the headers there. I'd break them up and, and address them each individually. But in this situation, we're going to look at them together. Because in this, it sort of lays out this pattern for us to understand what it means to follow Jesus. Now, when we open up to Matthew 16, we have to realize that we're in the midpoint of Jesus's ministry. He's, he's already had a number of years where he's going through uh, the land of Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond, and he's preaching the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. He's, he's doing miracles. He's performing um, a mighty acts, like the kingdom of heaven is breaking in. He's healing people, casting out demons, doing all kinds of, of unbelievable things. Things that when people see them, it's like they rub their eyes in, in disbelief. They're awestruck. They're captivated by this. And there's something about Jesus that causes wherever he tends to go, people show up. There's a lot of fans of Jesus sort of circulating through this land. But at this point, there are very few followers. And as Jesus has generated a lot of interest from the people in the land, he asks his disciples a question in verses 13 through 15. He says to them, if you want to look with me, he says, now, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? Now, they said, said um, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now, this is a text that's often misunderstood. Um, when Jesus asks the disciples who the people say the Son of Man is, he's not asking the disciples, who do people say that I am? What Jesus is talking about is there is an Old Testament figure that is called the Son of Man. This is a figure that both Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, is, is probably one of the most notable passages that speaks about this, but is also a reoccurring theme through all of Ezekiel's ministry. They both speak of this son of man, this, this, um, this Messiah figure, this king of the cosmos, this, this ideal man who will step into the world that would be divinely appointed by God to establish the kingdom of heaven. And he would do this by defeating God's opponents. And Daniel has this vivid imagery of, of four beasts in Daniel chapter 7. And one of them, the last one's a, a gnarly beast. But Daniel's dream is that this, this one who is like the ancient of days, the son of man, will defeat the beast. And after the beast has been defeated, then this son of man, the ancient of days, would receive glory and dominion, be able, able to exercise authority over the cosmos to rule and to reign in a way which leads to the flourishing of all things. So this son of man would step in, would conquer, and then restore the world to what it was meant to be. And so when Jesus asked this question in verse 13, he's asking who the people think will fulfill Daniel's prophecy of this son of man. Now we see this um, because of who they guess, right? They, they guess a couple of, actually all the people that they guess in this passage are deceased at this point. If you flip back to, I think it's in, in John maybe 12, no, John 14, John the Baptist has already been beheaded and all of the other guys have come into the Old Testament You've got, um, well, let's see here. You've got Elijah, you've got Jeremiah, and, and the other prophets. All of these other people, all of those ones who they think are the son of man have already come and died, and they're still kind of this waiting for that thing, the renewal of all things to happen. Now, with these guesses, Jesus doesn't respond to any of them. Jesus doesn't actually correct any of them. He, he sort of just lets it hang in the air. But then he turns and he asks his disciples a different but related question in verse 15. He says to them, but who do you say that I am? Now, in this moment, Jesus is asking his disciples, who do you think, who, who do you say that I am? 
Now, this is perhaps the most important question that we all must answer. Who do you say Jesus is? Is is he just a nice guy? Just a guy that, you know, he's one way to the Father among many. He's friendly. He's just just, like, he's more of a buddy, I guess, than he is really my Lord and Savior. We we have to ask this question, and, and, and our answer is very important. Now, in this moment, when Peter hears this question, something clicks for him. So something, something falls into place. And you see his response in verse 16. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Jesus affirms what Peter says. Now, this is an important moment. This is a huge Moment. Peter is recognizing that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. Now, w- when we see, um, we have some language issues here. Not, they're not really issues, but we have to understand this to be able to, to see the connections that are being drawn here. In, in the Hebrew, um, the text, when they talk about the Messiah, this deliverer, right, the, the son of man, they would use the word Messiah. It's a Hebrew word. But using the Greek language, the, the, the parallel to that Messiah, the Hebrew word Messiah, is Christ, Christos. It's, it's the same sort of title, it's the same function, the same idea, the Savior, the Deliverer, the Messiah, the Christ. Peter realizes that Jesus is the Son of Man. He's connecting the Son of God to the Son of Man. The two are one. They're overlapping. He's realizing that Jesus didn't just come to to enlighten people about matters of wisdom. He didn't come just to perform these these miraculous deeds in front of people. He didn't come just to shock people. That Jesus had come into the world to restore the broken world, to to, to take the throne and rule over the cosmos. Now this is monumental. This is, for the first time, we see one of Jesus' disciples professing faith in Jesus. Not, Not just following him from town to town, city to city, watching him teach and preach and do all of that stuff, but actually confess that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the Son of Man, that he is the Christ. And Jesus affirms Peter in this and says to him, Blessed are you, Simon. Now, we, we go in to see this, that, that there's this, this blessing in this profession. He goes in, in verse 18, and he says to Peter, I will build my church. I tell you, Peter, you are Peter, and I, uh, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. It's because Peter has professed faith in Jesus that he's blessed And then there's this legacy that comes from him, that Jesus will build his church on him. Now, for the the reader of Matthew's gospel, if you pick up Matthew's gospel and read through this and sort of like follow some of the thematic stuff that Matthew's trying to to put in front for the reader, this revelation isn't necessarily shocking. To see Jesus... Um, actually be called the son of man to, 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 to draw that connection isn't really that shocking because all throughout Matthew's gospel, he's been laying these breadcrumbs. Jesus had been talking, not, not directly about himself, but saying the son of man must do this. The Lord, the Lord of the Sabbath, the son of man is the Lord of the Sabbath. He keeps going through. In fact, Matthew's chapter 8, 9, 10, and 11, Jesus is making references to being the son of man. And so when you read this, and you come to chapter 16, and you see Peter, what seems to be slow Peter, um, finally getting with the program, we, we, you know, come on, Peter, duh, what do you think? How, how can you be so dense? And I think that's, actually, that's where I've been. I, I'm probably almost every time that I've read this passage, I just shook my head at Peter, come on, dude, get it together. You're just, you're a disappointment to us all here. But if we think of Peter as an idiot, 
for not seeing this reality sooner, that exposes our own foolishness. Because Peter didn't arrive at the conclusion that Jesus was the Christ, that Jesus was the Messiah, by scientific process. Peter didn't put the pieces together to to finally figure it out. He didn't do the the intellectual hardworking and and, and trying to assemble this idea. This was revealed to Peter by the Heavenly Father. This is what verse 17 says. Jesus says, hey, after, after Peter professes faith in Christ, Jesus answered him, said, blessed are you, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. It was God who opened his eyes to see who it was right before him. There's no way that human intellect can naturally come to that conclusion. In fact, that's one of the things that we talked about last week when the cross is represented as the power of God and the wisdom of God, that God has to open up our eyes to see and to understand because in our minds, what God is thinking is way upside down. It's backwards. But the word of the cross is the wisdom of God. Now this goes to show it is possible to be around the church. It's it's possible to be familiar with who Jesus is and not get it and not make that connection, not understand the gravity of who this Jesus really is. You can grow up in Sunday school programs, do all the programs, attend Sunday mornings, and there is no guarantee that it will naturally click just because of where you physically put yourself. And, and, and for example of this, all we gotta do is look at Judas. Judas. Judas spent three years walking around with Jesus. He saw everything that all the other disciples did. Simply putting yourself in a physical location does not guarantee that your eyes will be open to see and understand who Jesus really is. We need the Heavenly Father to enlighten the eyes of our heart. That's one of the things that Paul, when he's writing to the Ephesians, he acknowledges, hey, uh, I, I see that God has opened your eyes to comprehend the mystery of the gospel. I see that God has opened your eyes so that you would see the word of the cross, not as foolishness, but the wisdom and power of God. Now, this is the first distinctive of the cruciform life that our eyes are open to see the real Jesus. Or in other words, we have faith in Jesus, the Son of Man. We believe that Jesus is not just a good man, not just one way of many to get back to the Father. He is the Messiah. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through him. He is the Savior, the Healer, the King, and Lord. Jesus is the Son of Man, the Ancient of Days. Now, it is God who opens our eyes to see this. Now, the reason for this is so that we can't boast. Paul talked about going back again, 1 Corinthians 1. You, you, I just hope you see how interconnected all of this cruciform language, the message of the cross is throughout all of the, the, the New Testament, but even going back to the Old Testament. It's so interconnected. It's all weaved together. But, but Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 1, this is God's work. The work of faith is God's work so that no one can boast. And that our, our boast would only be in the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean we sort of just kick our feet up and just trust that God's going to sort of beam down the gospel to our unbelieving friends and family members or coworkers or like magically save our kids if we just sort of kick up and, you know, do that. that that's not how it works. God uses our faithfulness. He uses our, our labor in discipleship and mission, but it's God who opens the eyes of the heart. And so as we labor in discipleship, making disciples of our kids and our homes, of our wives, of our husbands, we make disciples in our workplace, as we live on mission, proclaiming the message of Jesus to those who do not yet believe, who do not yet see with the eyes of faith, we pray that God would open their eyes. 
Because even the best gospel presentation, even the most genuine and compassionate expression of love is not enough to open the eyes of the heart. God must do it. God is sovereign in salvation. And so we ask that he would act to make people see. We pray for our kids, that God would open the eyes of the heart of our kids. Our neighborhood. Now, as we pray for other people, as we, and that's really what it means to be on mission. Like, uh, we, we labor, we work, we, we, we demonstrate the love of Jesus in serving and, and blessing, but also proclaiming the gospel. As we're living on mission, we must also pray the same thing for ourselves, too. That the eyes of our heart would be increasingly opened to see Jesus more rightly. To see Jesus for who he really is. Because though Peter confessed Jesus as the Christ, he was not seeing Jesus clearly yet. He would, eventually. He would come around. But there were all kinds of assumptions and misconceptions that Peter carried with him and projected them on to Jesus. And doing so, it clouded the vision of the real Jesus. Peter thought that Jesus was a certain kind of Messiah, that, that, that this Christ would rise up in a certain kind of way, that it would be this up into the right trajectory for Jesus. And he thought, like many of the Jews, and this is why there's the triumphal entry as Jesus comes into Jerusalem, what they're thinking is that this Jesus is going to come and bring military force to restore the kingdom, to restore the nation of Israel. That through political power, Jesus was going to rule and set all things right in the land of Israel. But even thinking that, their, their vision of Jesus was way too small. That's why when Jesus starts talking, as you move into verses 21 and the following verses, when Jesus starts talking about being humiliated, when Jesus starts saying, hey, my life is not going to go up into the right. In fact, it's going to take a, st- a very steep plummet here. I'm going to suffer many things at the hands of righteous men, religious men, to the point where I will be killed. That's what he says in verse 21. He says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go. He must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Jesus is laying all of this stuff out. This is, he's saying, this is the real Jesus. This is the kind of Christ that you need. This is who I am. And Peter I don't know. I don't know what to think about this because, it, you know, he says, in verse 22, Peter took him aside. It seems like he's being kind of polite. Hey, hey, Jesus, why don't you come over here? Let's have a talk real quick. But then he proceeds to rebuke Jesus. The, the man, he said, yeah, you're, you're the Christ. You're the son of man. You're the son of the living God. And Peter rebukes Jesus. Now, the audacity of Peter to do this, right? Can, can you wrap your mind? Or, like, to think like God would put himself beneath you and you could critique God. You, you know, God, I've been thinking about it and I just don't know. You, you seem to be off the mark here. That, that's what Peter's doing here. Jesus, you got the wrong narrative. You're not gonna suffer and die. There's no way you could suffer these things. There's no way you'll be killed. You must be mistaken. That's not, that's not the way it's supposed to go. Now, what Peter's doing here is something that we all do as well. What Peter's doing here, do you you see this? Peter is creating his own version of Jesus. The real Jesus is in front of him. And Jesus says, here's what the real Jesus has to do. And Peter says, no, 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 no. No, my Jesus He's going to do this. See, we do the same thing Peter does. We make a counterfeit Jesus who will give us what we want from life. And I think that it, it typically boils down to two things, and, and, and we could talk more about it and build this out even further if we wanted to, but I, I think really it boils down to these two things. We want comfort, 
and we want self-fulfillment. We want comfort, we want self-fulfillment. And I think you don't have to look far in our culture to see that that's really, that's really the underlying thing that every marketing ad is pushing. Hey, this will get you the cushy life you want. This will really make you happy if you get this, or, or if you do this, or, or if you think this way. This is what will get you comfort and self Fulfillment, And I think because of this, because we are uh, uh, drenched in a culture that idolizes comfort and self-fulfillment, we tend to have an aversion of doing hard and meaningful things. We would rather do what's easy and expedient. We'd rather lay low at home, kind of isolate ourselves in our modern-day fortresses, behind our big old TVs and uh, streaming all of our whatever. You probably got like six different streaming things, right? right? Everybody does at this point. Binging Netflix, laying low, avoiding people. You, you get into this rut of, I'd call it a, a rut of laziness or sloth. Bible would call it that, where, where we're neglecting the, the spiritual matters that really, really matter most. We're not getting in our Bible our prayer life is really inconsistent. It seems so much easier to, to find a project around the house to do than it does to sit down and open up my Bible and see what the, the living God has to say to me today. And then, and then as this goes, we more and more build this life that sort of revolves around me. Rather than, than being on mission in our neighborhoods or at work, well, because that makes me feel uncomfortable, right? To, to, to let people know that I think this way about Jesus, to share the gospel with them, to, to even to bless them with loving uh, acts of service. And so we sort of flake out on our missional community mission. We're not serving our city. It's because this comfort, the, the idol of comfort, the idol of self-fulfillment doesn't lend itself to those things that are noble, that are fruitful. And because they don't come easy, we don't do them. Because as we swim in this current, this cultural current, we become happier with easy. Easy makes me happy. So much so that we tend to only exert effort to the degree of our own happiness. Meaning, I'm willing to work hard at work if it means that I can get a paycheck that'll get me the thing that I want that I think will make me happy. Again, self-fulfillment. It's, it's all orbiting around me. In other words, we want our own kingdom in our own way. We want our own kingdom, and we're going to get it on our own terms. We want blessing. Give me, give me all the blessing, but we don't want any of the burden. We want the happiness without the holiness. We want the glory without Suffering, And so what do we do? We invent a fake Jesus that functions like a sidekick to help us get it. We, we use Jesus like a stepping stone. We don't want Jesus for Jesus. We want Jesus so he can help us get our comfort, so we can, so we can get our, our self-fulfillment, that true happiness. Now, you can do that. And, and many people in our culture are doing that right now. And I'd say there are many people in the church, many Christians who are doing that right now. You can do that. You can gain the world. But Jesus says in verse 26, it will cost you your soul. You can gain self-fulfillment. You can gain personal comfort, but it will cost you your soul. You will pay everything for that. In that case, it's better for you and me because as I'm preaching to you, I'm preaching to me too. In this case, it's better for us to receive Jesus' rebuke to Peter as a rebuke for us. When Jesus says to him, verse 23, Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Jesus doesn't seem very nice right there. I don't know. Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things 
of man. If comfort and self-fulfillment are our telos, the telos is, is the, like the end-all, be-all. It's, it's what we're shooting for. It's what we're aspiring to. It's the vision of the good life. If comfort and self-fulfillment are the telos, then our minds are set on things, not of God, but the things of man. And if our minds are set on the things of man, like Peter, we can be a hindrance to Jesus. See, what Peter is suggesting to Jesus is that there can be glory without the cross. That Jesus can rise up, he can build the kingdom of God without any kind of suffering. Now, the reason why Jesus calls him Satan is because literally, while Jesus is in the, in the wilderness, those 40 days, 40 nights, fasting, beginning his ministry, guess what Satan's trying to tell Jesus? He's telling Jesus, you can have the kingdom of God. I'll give you what you want. You don't have to do it. You don't have to go to the cross. I'll give you, if you just bow down and worship me. See, the same thing is being echoed in, in Peter's mind. His minds are set on the things of man. If there is no cross, then Christianity is futile. See, if there's no cross, Jesus doesn't defeat the enemy. The, the whole idea of the cross is, is right there. That's the death blow. It looks like Jesus is the one that's losing, but really it's the enemy. It's Satan who's being crushed underneath his foot. Jesus defeats the enemy through the cross. And that same cross, just as, as Moses lifted up that snake on the pole in the wilderness and, and people were snake bit and they looked to the, to, the, to the snake on the pole and they're healed by it, the same thing. Jesus, as we look to Jesus on the cross, the world is healed. The ailments of our society, it's not fixed by legislation. It's not fixed by new laws. It's fixed by looking to Jesus and so the cruciform life doesn't just begin with faith in a version of Jesus, but faith in the real Jesus, the crucified Savior. That's the one who our faith rests upon. Now, when you see what the real Jesus has done for you, that he went to the cross and died in your place, you are drawn to him. That's the effectual calling of God. You see your, the eyes of your heart are opened. You see your heart moves toward him. It's not just that you say a prayer, not just that you say, you know, you profess faith and say, yeah, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and then you go on with life business as usual. That, that profession leads right into a life of following Jesus. That's why these, these passages are butted up all together next to one each other. The, Peter confesses. Peter's uh, rebuked for the wrong confession of, of the wrong Jesus, invited into the real Jesus. And then here, follow the real Jesus who lives and dies by the cross. Therefore, a Christian will follow Jesus in every area of life. Not, not just in the spiritual matters, but, but what the Lord has to say about what we do with our money how we use our bodies, the kind of job, the way that I do my job, the way that I live in my neighbor. He speaks to it all. How I raise my kids, how I help raise them up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Jesus speaks to everything. And as Christians, we are to listen and follow his commands because, listen, this might seem weird. This, this might seem, oh, I, I gotta obey Jesus, so you, you know, we are obeying the crucified king who laid down his life for us. Everything that he does is for our good. There are no bad rules in Jesus' view, right? That, that Jesus is incapable of laying out a bad template of here's what you should do with your life. Now, unfortunately, in Christian, Christianity Day, in the church today, discipleship is truncated, Discipleship gets boiled down to say the prayer, get your foot in the door of heaven, and then just hang on until Jesus comes back. But what Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, Bonhoeffer says in, in the book of, uh, of The Cost of Discipleship, which, by the way, this whole book is money. Like I could preach a whole series from this book. Honestly, it's so good. Um, but what, what Dietrich Bonhoeffer calls this is cheap grace. And cheap grace is the deadly enemy of the church. It's grace without discipleship. 
It's grace without following Jesus, without trusting Jesus and obeying him. Because genuine faith in the real Jesus will always lead to obedience of the real Jesus. Always. That's why Jesus says in verse 24, he said this to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. When Jesus uses this language of follow me, come after me, deny yourself, that's obedience language. That, that's, that's all in the same vernacular of obedience, of following, doing as the Lord commands. Now, this is what our response to costly grace is, to see the cross for what it really is because it cost Jesus everything that we would have the obedience of faith. In fact, that term, the obedience of faith, is what the Apostle Paul bookends uh, the, the letter to the Romans with. I'm saying these things so that you would have the obedience of faith. I'm saying these things so that you would have the obedience of faith, that faith, genuine faith, produces obedience to Jesus. Now, let let me just read... A brief excerpt here from from Dietrich Bonhoeffer in this, this thing. He says this, Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow, and it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus. It is costly because it costs a man his life, and it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of his son. Ye were bought at a price. And what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son to dear a price to pay for our life, but delivered him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. Costly grace is the sanctuary of God. It has to be protected from the world and not thrown to the dogs. It is therefore the living word, the word of God, which he speaks as it pleases him. Costly grace confronts us as a gracious call to follow Jesus. It comes as a word of forgiveness to the broken spirit and the contrite heart. Now listen to this. Grace is costly because it compels a man to submit to the yoke of Christ and follow him. It is grace because Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. This is costly grace. It calls us to follow Jesus, to believe and to obey him, even when we can't see clearly or understand everything fully. Obedience is the second primary distinctive of the cruciform life. First is faith in the real Jesus. The second is obedience to the real Jesus. To follow, to obey. Now, we have been conditioned in our culture to think obedience is cold and rigid and is life-robbing. That if I give myself to obedience, I somehow am going to live a depleted life. I'm not going to have what I really want. That is completely false. Totally false. That's a lie from the devil. Because Jesus says the opposite in verse 25. He says, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. He's saying, you actually find real life in me when you deny yourself. When you take up your cross and follow him, your obedience to Jesus, regardless of how much suffering you occur along the way, will get repaid to you with glory. That's what verse 27 says. Jesus says, for the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father. So there's glory abounding here. And then he will repay each person according to what, that, what he has done. Jesus will take the glory of his Father and then repay us for the obedience that we have lived into in our time here on earth. That's where the full life is. 
No, we can't be mistaken here. I'm bringing it to a close. We can't be mistaken. Obedience cannot justify us. Your obedience is too faltering and failing to make you and keep you right with God. You cannot be justified by obedience. You cannot earn salvation. You cannot make God um, happier with you by your obedience. Only Jesus can do that. That's why the cross is such good news. Jesus paid, for the, pri- paid the price for our disobedience, credits us with his perfect obedience. But when we have received that gift, our obedience to Jesus expresses our love for God. You have to see this underneath the Christian vision of obedience is the driving force of love. Jesus says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Go down a little bit further in John 14, 21. Whoever has my commands and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself in him. Obedience is a product of love. Faith begets love. Love begets obedience. There's a natural progression in the Christian life. And and if, if there is not obedience, that means that there's something wrong upstream from there. Either my love, my affection is misguided, or I'm not seeing the real Jesus. And the eyes of my heart need to be opened up in this new way. Now, when we talk about love, our culture has a warped version of love. Our culture says, love on my terms. Love by my definition. And this means that love is not connected to obedience. Love is not connected to loyalty. Love is wavering. It's faltering. It's come and go. Now, Jesus, I believe, would rebuke this I know he would. He would rebuke this version of love, this, this man-made, it's thinking like a man and not with the mind of God, that this kind of love is wicked. It's not love, it's counterfeit love because love produces obedience and loyalty. And we see the purest kind of love at the cross. At the cross, Jesus shows us what real and perfect love looks like as he entrusted himself to his heavenly father. Philippians 2.8 says that Jesus was obedient to the point of death. In the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus is sweating blood, he's crying out to the father. He knows that the cross is coming. All of it's coming. He cries out to God. He's like, take this cup from me. If it's your will, God, remove this cup from me. But then he entrust himself to the Father. He has faith in the Father's plan. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. And Jesus says, now what compels Jesus to obey this kind of way? What, what compels Jesus' radical obedience to the Heavenly Father? It's love. He says this in John 14, 31, but I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. See, Jesus links love and obedience. This is what ultimately led Jesus to go to the cross. Now, not only does Jesus has a, have a love for God to do his will, but a love for all humanity. See, until you see that the cross was done for you and for me, not in this general sort of vague application of here's, here's some forgiveness for humanity, but in a real intimate way. To see as the apostle Paul sees in Galatians 2.20 where he says that he, Jesus, loved me and gave himself up for me. He, he sees this as very intimate. Jesus loves me. We sing about a song, right? As a kid, we hear, Jesus loves me, this I know, right? We see the cross proves that Jesus loves me. He loves you. And what Jesus, he goes a step further in John 17, 10, 17. Jesus says that this self-denying love, this, this 
refusal to, do his, to, to build his own kingdom his own way, right? He could, have, he could have veered off from God's plan and built his own kingdom in his own way, but instead he, he denies himself. His love for the Father compels him to obedience and says, for this reason, the Father loves me. This is where he's talking about being the great shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. See, this is the reason that the Father loves Jesus, that he laid his life down for us. And God did not leave him in a grave. God did not leave him in a tomb, but by his power, the vindication of God rested upon him, raised him three days later, just as Jesus prophesied to his disciples. Now, when we see this kind of love that's communicated at the cross, when we see Jesus, the real Jesus, this potent, pure, untainted love, self-giving, self-dying love. When we see it, we cannot help but to believe it and then to obey him. This is the beginning. These are the two distinctives of the cruciform life, to believe on the crucified one and to obey the crucified one. And this is an invitation for you to empty yourself, to empty yourself so that you would be filled and comforted by God, that you'd find true joy, that you would find the abundant life, that you would abide in God and he would abide in you. And this looks like putting on this yoke of Jesus, right? The whole yoke idea, the the vision of a yoke, uh, 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 an animal wearing a, a yoke is that that animal is in obedience to the master. And so it is with the Christian life that the yoke of Jesus is upon us, but the yoke he puts on us is not burdensome and crushing. It gives us life. It's easy and light because the law of the Lord refreshes the soul. It's perfect in all its ways. So the cruciform life is an invitation to see the real Jesus, obey the real Jesus, And as we do that, we get way more than what we bargained for. We gain way more than we could ever have dreamed. Because Jesus makes every bit of his inheritance, every bit of the kingdom of heaven, every nook and cranny, now we become co-heirs with him. But to get to the glory, it's to live by the cross. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we have a meal up here this morning, something tangible that we can take in our hands, put in our mouth, that reminds us of the kind of love that you have for us. You tell us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. While we were in the midst of our misery and sin, while we were hostile in mind and spirit towards you, you set your love on us that we might be swayed. We would find a a powerful um, affection, a new affection in our hearts because Jesus has demonstrated the love of God. This morning, we see that we were were reminded of it, that Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took his body, or took the bread and broke it and said, this is my body, take and eat. He lifted the cup and said, this is, this is my blood shed for you. This is the cup of the new covenant. Take and drink. Do this in remembrance of me. And today we take this meal in remembrance of you. And this meal helps sustain us in a life that points to you. It's the fuel that we need to live the cruciform life. And as we receive Christ, we receive also the power of the spirit that enables us to obey you to say no to our flesh, to to say no to the small vision of self-fulfillment and comfort, and to say yes to the things that are of God, to think God's thoughts after you. So would you help us this day? Would the meal do something powerful in our souls? Would it refresh us? Would it invigorate us? And would it call us to the cross that others might live through our uh, dying acts of love? God, we ask that you would do this mighty thing through this church for your glory, for our good, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.